we cannot simply view the sharing of faith with young people as a matter of teaching them religion, as a matter of giving them the facts, all right? We're recognizing, I think, today that the process of sharing faith, again, in that sense that I defined it, that personal love relationship with God, that that process of sharing faith with young people is much broader than that. And if we don't recognize the need for a broader kind of ministry, then our attempts specifically at formal religious education are going to be really difficult, if not failures. And I think in many, many cases they've been failures, right? So we're sharing a model of total youth ministry, uh, a visual graphic attempt to show how all of the different levels of ministry to young people can be integrated into an understandable whole. Now that's promising a lot, but I think we can do that. The model that I want to share with you is one that some of you may be familiar with already. Uh, it was developed by a Father Don Kimball, uh, who is a, a youth minister in the Santa Rosa Diocese of uh, California. Uh, Father Don developed what has been called the wedge model of youth ministry because of its graphic uh, presentation. Very, very helpful. The reason it's called the wedge model of youth ministry is that the graphic part of the model is based on a wedge. Kimball talks about several different stages in the process of sharing faith with young people. I think he has three to four basic ones. I've added a, one or two. We're both in agreement, though. We're going to move from left to right here in the model. We're both in agreement that the foundation of all youth ministry, the ground level upon which all ministry to young people has to be based, is an area that has been, in many cases, sadly neglected, and that's the first stage. The stage is what is called relational ministry, and I'll have to abbreviate because of the, the room we have available. Relational ministry is simply, but very importantly, this. It is the, the, the basic idea of building relationships of trust with young people, usually on a one-to-one -one basis. And the need for relational ministry is founded upon the very commonsensical kind of recognition that there is absolutely no reason why young people should even listen to what we have to say, let alone believe it, if they don't trust us in the first place. So the, the first stage of effective and total youth ministry will be relational ministry, the development of relationships of trust, many times on a one-to-one -one basis with young people. When we do that effectively, when young people experience that sense of trusting relationship with members of the adult community in the church and with each other, they will automatically want to celebrate that and to deepen it, which means this, that they will automatically want to gather together in communities. And the experience of community and what can happen within that experience is kind of the second dimension of this model of youth ministry. By this we mean the kind of community that many times can only be built through recreational activities, uh, youth groups, uh, field trips, campouts, dances, athletic events, all of those kinds of contacts, social contacts, uh, and contacts with young people, uh, provide a framework in which that sense of community can be established. It's important to recognize the value and the, the goodness of strictly the recreational end of this, okay, the playing of the basketball games and so on, but also recognizing that it's within that context that we want the good news proclaimed. The good news is always proclaimed not only through words, but through our values, through our witness and so on with young people. Okay? Another term for it, obviously, if this is pre-evangelization, it's precisely this communication of the good news and the proclamation of it that is what we mean by evangelization. It's important to note here that sense of enthusiastic proclamation of the good news by committed people happens in a community of trust. All right? Now, once the good news is proclaimed, once it's shouted from the rooftops and so on, there is a critical next stage and one that uh, we're going to spend quite a bit of time on happens right in here. Basically what the stage is is this. There is always a need for the individual person to freely respond to that proclamation, 
to either accept it or reject it or demonstrate a degree of further openness to it or to say right now it doesn't make much sense to me. That kind of a decision has to be made before we can move on in the process. Uh, Kimball calls that moment, this moment of decision here, he calls it a personal encounter with Jesus. I prefer to call it a moment of recognition. The reason I like the term recognition and a moment of recognition is that it says even in its root meaning what happens here. Recognition is recognition. It's knowing again. Right? You can't recognize somebody unless you've seen them already. If, if somebody's walking down the street and you say, uh, there goes Mary, I recognize her, the only reason you recognize Mary is you met her before somewhere. Right? This experience of a moment of recognition or this encounter with, a, with Jesus in a personal way is the aha moment, right? The aha moment. It's that moment in our lives when the lights go on, when all of a sudden maybe all of the, the diverse teachings and religious practices and all of the heritage that we were given in our families and so on, when all of that apparently confused and disconnected experience kind of just falls together all those pieces of the puzzle fall together and there's almost that sense of eureka you know I found it for every Christian who is going to mature as a Christian there will be that experience and probably many of those kinds of experiences where the lights go on and it becomes all of a sudden not a God out there but one in here where it becomes not a, a problem to be solved but a, a life to be lived where it becomes very real to me in my guts okay it's only after that moment of personal recognition, that aha moment, it's only after that that the next stage can be effectively shared with young people. And that is the stage that with some uh, explanation I'm going to call catechesis. Catechesis. The reason I hesitate to use the term is that in our sense today of catechesis, we are recognizing that if we properly understand it, it includes all of this. All right, catechesis can be viewed as the whole ball of wax. The, the common perception of the term, though, I think, is more clearly in this restricted sense, which could be identified, for instance, as formal religious education programs. It's the sense that after the moment of personal recognition, after the aha moment, there is the need to delve into a deeper sense of understanding of what the message is all about. Once we experience this, we want to start tying together the loose ends. And people will begin to open up to things like scripture study and church history and all kinds of things because they need it now. It has a personal relevance to them. So it's never a question, I, in my mind anyway, it's never a question of categorically saying high school kids are turned off by religion and they don't want to study it. Those who are turned off by it have simply not been properly ministered to. But it's very possible that they can become extremely excited about their faith and studying it in depth. The next stage is this. If we have experiences of trusting relationships with young people, if because of that we can share with them a, a spirit of community and within that context proclaim the good news, if after that individuals recognize the personal relevance of that and have an aha moment, a moment of insight, and because of that are willing to look more closely at the gospel and its implications and so on. The, the result of that process is going to be the next stage, if you will, of total youth ministry, and that is service. Why the wedge? Why the wedge model? Why that kind of graphic presentation? To me, it's probably one of the most uh, encouraging dimensions of the whole model. One of the things that makes it so uh, affirming to those of us in youth work, it's this, that as you move through the process, as you move from relational ministry to proclamation of the good news through catechesis and service and so on, as you move through the process, you are always going to be dealing with fewer and fewer people. The purpose of the model is not to analyze individuals or in any way to evaluate their own Christian growth. The purpose of the model is to help us evaluate our own ministry as a community and to give that ministry a sense of cohesion and direction. 
For instance, if you apply the model to the parish situation, what it can do is, is tell, tell you this and give you this kind of direction, that if we are to effectively minister to the young people of this, this parish, we must, on an ongoing basis, provide relational ministry. On an ongoing basis, continually, we have to offer opportunities for retreats and other kinds of evaluation. On an ongoing basis, we try to provide good opportunities for catechesis. On an ongoing basis, we have service opportunities so that the young people themselves, given a response to their own needs and in touch with their own readiness, can enter into the experience wherever they feel the need. I think the reason the model works, the reason that people have their own kinds of aha moments when they're looking at it, is that there is a sense here of what's happening in the church as a whole. There are all kinds of reflections of, for instance, uh, recent church documents and so on that can be tied into this. For instance, uh, one of the most important recent church documents on religious education and communicating the Christian message was the uh, pastoral letter from the bishops in the United States to teach as Jesus did. In that document, we for the first time clearly and from an authoritative body, if you will, defined the educational mission of the church as something more than simply class experience or teaching formal classes. And the, the terminology that was used in that document was very helpful and became very popular at uh, religious education workshops and so on. What we said in that document, or what the American bishops said, is that the educational mission of the church includes at least three dimensions. And we identified those as community, message, and service. Right? The same three dimensions that are represented on the model here.